I'm Chris Guns and welcome to PBI Radio everybody. I am about to be joined by one time Keith Thurman, Clearwater, Florida's own. He's a fast rising contender and he's promoted by Golden Boy. He's managed by Al Heyman and he's trained by Dan Birmingham. So the future appears to be open to him and I'm sure he's got a lot to say. So let's go and get on the line right now with Keith One Time Thurman. Keith Thurman, man, thanks for being here. No Appreciate problem. Time. Thanks for having me. Tell me, tell me about yourself, Keith. You, you, you were born in Clearwater. Yeah, I was born uh, in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I still live in the same neighborhood that I originally learned how to box in. Uh, my elementary school is right around the corner from me. And originally, I had my original trainer, Ben Getty. Uh, he trained me from the age of seven to the age of 20 when he passed away. And uh, Ben threw on a boxing exhibition for the after-school YMCA program. And it was after me seeing that, uh, that pretty impressive exhibition that I took the papers, took them home, and uh, had my mother sign them and come down to school and talk uh, with my trainer because he was the head janitor of that elementary school. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, you know, I mean, I've just been in the gym and been working, man, just been living the dream. How old were you when you first went to the gym? Uh, I was seven years old, but, uh, I had my first fight when I was about nine. Wow. And, and what kind of neighborhood do you live in and did you grow up in? Uh, it's, it's either, I don't know, it's not your, it's not your upper, it's not your upper neighborhood or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a lower, um, suburb type, uh, neighborhood, you know, slightly what we call ghetto or whatnot, mm -hmm. but, um, I don't like that term because there's too many ghettos in America, you know, so I'm not going to act like I've, I've had the worst upbringing or I lived in the worst neighborhood or nothing like that, you know. Um, just, been, just been blessed, man. I've just been blessed. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me about your, your household growing up, like the Thurman household. What, what, what would I see in there? You got, how, many, how many siblings you got? Um, in the household, zero. Okay. Um, I'm, the, I'm the only one. Um, that my mother had, and growing up, my mom and father split while I was really young, mm -hmm. and uh, even before I got into boxing, my dad had uh, made one little sister for me. Two years later, I got another little sister, and then two years after that, I got a baby brother. So um, I got, you know, I got siblings, but they're not in the same household. Mm -hmm. um, my mom just was working hard every day, working at nine to five doing what, it, uh, what she had to do to provide a household, you know, and, um, you know, daycare and stuff like that. And, uh, luckily, once when I got into boxing, the boxing dues were only five bucks a month if you were a member to the local recreation. Wow. That's, that's a pretty yeah. good price. <laughs> that's a bargain. And, and oh, yeah. oh, everybody could afford that. You know? Yeah. And, and you got... You got you, you got to see that exhibition, and, and you just were mesmerized by the sport, and, and you just decided to get into it right away then. So you started training at 7, and, and you had your first fight at 9. Tell me, tell me about your, your, what you'd see in the gym in, in Clearwater. Who, who would you see? Would you see anybody that, that we know? Uh, at a young age, I did run across uh, Andre Berto. Mm -hmm. Um. I think the first time I got to see Berto spar, I might have been about maybe 11, 12 years old, and he came in to work with um, one of our fighters at that time who was around his same age. And, uh, you know, Berto was, Berto was a little better or whatnot, but that's, that's what our trainer looked for. You know, he always tried to find the best sparring. And um, so the, the, the guy Berto sparred, his name is Chris Rangel, and at a young age, that was one of the first fighters that I started to look up to. You know, he was pretty much the best dude in our gym. Yeah, yeah. And you, you ended up having 101, 101 wins, right? How many lost you have? Uh, 16. Wow, that's a great record, man. And you're a six-time national champion. Who are some of the guys that you faced to win some of those championships? Um, um, Demetrius Andrade, mm -hmm. Charles Hatley, um, I fought this fighter named Dominique Dalton. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a pretty pretty good Boyd, competition. Boyd Nelson. Wow. Uh, and those are some of the some of those the some of the memorable names for me. Yeah. And in 2006, you're the PAL national champ. What was that like? Um. That was um. That was pretty in 2006. That one was the one that qualified me. Um, that was the first qualifier for the 2007 Olympic trials, you know, mm -hmm. which would create the team for 2008. Um, so I felt really great about uh, winning that tournament because I already got a spot in the Olympic trials as soon as I won that tournament. Mm -hmm. um, and to win that tournament, I did end up facing Charles Hatley in the finals. That was the first time we ever met up. And... Uh, I got a little phone call from Berto telling me that Hatley's a great fighter. Don't underestimate him. And, you know, because he kind of stuck around for another four years trying to make the Olympic team. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I did my thing, man. I just stayed composed. I threw my uh, combination. And I think because I was young, um, mm -hmm. he kind of underestimated me a little bit. He tried to take it right to me. And he just kind of left himself open a little bit, and I was able to beat him on points. Yeah, and in those 2008 Olympic trials, you, you ended up getting the silver medal. You lost to a guy that you beat previously, Dimitri Andrade. How did it feel to miss the Olympics? Was it was it a big goal, or was it? Oh uh, yeah, man, it was a big goal, you know. But um, you know, to be honest, I knew it was going to be tough. Um, Dimitri Andrade was the favorite that year. Um. He just has that the uh, amateur boxing style, you know, and he and he's a great fighter. Um, we fought multiple times in the amateurs, um, so we are well rounded with each other's styles, and you know, the pressure was on, and he just beat me by points. Yeah, did you feel kind of overwhelmed by the pressure? That's uh, a little bit, you know, not really overwhelmed, you know, but. The pressure was definitely there because I did. Um, the one thing that I didn't like about that fight was um, I was trying to be really cautious because I didn't want to let him get too much of a lead on the point gap mm -hmm. because they, in the amateur rankings, they let you know what your score is in between rounds. So as soon as somebody has a four or five point lead, they kind of know and they'll, they'll be a little conservative. Mm -hmm. So I was being conservative all start. Round one ended. The score was one to zero. And I was like, man, I don't know what's going on with these judges. And then I was being conservative in round two. And then we started to get some boos from the crowd. <laughs> and then that just hurt me, man. That just hurt me. Because <laughs> you, know? you, you see how I fight. You see what I do. Nice. And, you know, to hear some boos from the crowd, man, I mean, that <laughs> I was just like, man, this ain't your fight, Keith. You need to fight your fight. And, uh, you know, I try to pick up the pace a little bit, but like I said, you know, in the end, he just won on points. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think about the open scoring? Did you, would you rather fight in an open scoring thing, or are you happy that, that you don't find out till the end of the fight? Uh, what are you talking about with the score? Yeah, would you prefer that, that you knew the score during the fight? Um, a little bit, yeah. Hmm. You know, I mean, it is bad when, you know, it, I don't know, it has its pros and cons, yeah. but as a fighter, I kind of like to know what's going on in these judges' heads. Mm. What are they, how do they feel like I'm doing thus far? You know, because there's been some fights that I was behind. There was one fight I was behind eight points after round one. I picked up the pace, and I scored more points, but I was down eight points in round two. Luckily, at that time, we were going four rounds because now they're only going three. Mm -hmm. And I was able to almost catch up in the third round, and then I was able to pass him in the fourth round. Mm. So, you know, if I, if I wasn't getting that up to date, I might have not have done exactly what I needed to do to win that fight that day. Yeah, yeah. and it's good to know for a puncher because you want to know when you got to turn the man's lights out. You know? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And did you fight internationally too, or did you stay? Yeah, I had uh, I had two different international uh, competitions. One was versus Ukraine, and we did that here in America, um, in Chicago. 
Mm-hmm. Um, that was a great experience. Um, the, I was one of the only fighters to win on the USA team. The other fighter that won was um, Sean Porter. Mm-hmm. Wow. I faced Canada, and that was an interesting international because we actually had to fight each other, take a day off, then fight each other again. Wow. So I happened to stop my guy twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you you stop almost everybody. Almost. Yeah. Almost. What would you uh, think of the Ukraine guys' experiences? We saw them in the Olympics, and and our our Olympians just got drowned out by talent. What would you what you see back in two thousand? What was it? Two thousand six, seven, about? The other yeah, that was about two thousand six, probably. What would you see? Um, I saw talent, man. Mm. Uh, you know, I was the first guy to win on the USA team. Sean Porter was the second. And he was one way class above me at that time. So, you know, I saw all our small guys that I thought were fast and skillful and talented. I saw all of them get outboxed and outclassed, you know. So um, I got a lot of respect for the UK, uh, Ukraine fighters. Yeah, yeah. And, and where did, did the name one time come from? Who, who called you that the first time? Um, As an amateur or was that later on? No, actually, that was later on. It's actually a name that I stole from my father. Mm-hmm. He used to tell me about his little um, experiences growing up. And uh, he used to do a little bit of backyard brawling. He said they used to meet up around some railroad tracks or whatnot. And that the, the boys would put t- grab their T-shirts and wrap T-shirts around their hands and go at it. Mm. You know, <laughs> And with his, he used to be good at placing some nice body shots. And, you know, headshots, too. And I guess he got a little name called One Time. He said that's what everyone was calling him. And, um, you know, I figured my, my man's getting a little older. He's kind of retired. He's not going to be stepping in the ring or doing any real fighting anytime soon. So, you know, and plus I'm Keith Thurman Jr. So I figured I might as well just carry on that name. Yeah, yeah. And, and you did turn pro after after losing to Andrade. And, and what made you decide to turn pro when you did instead of sticking around since you're so young? My power. Yeah, you're better. You know, the- um, you know, in the amateurs, if I knock opponents down, which happened multiple times, if I knock somebody down with a straight right hand, and they get up and they hit me in the face with a jab, we're even. You know. Yeah. Yep. So it was, you know, it was just understanding the game and knowing that, you know, one day I was going to have to turn pro anyways, and I was mentally preparing myself to turn pro ever since I was 16. So. Mm. And do you remember who you fought and what the result was and where it was in your first fight as a pro? Um, yeah, as a pro, I had my first fight here locally in Florida um, in, in Tampa at the a la carte pavilion. Um, I signed a contract with, at that time, they don't know, that the promotional company doesn't no longer exist, but um, they were Star Fight Productions. Mm-hmm. And... I actually had my first eight professional fights here in Tampa out of that venue. Yeah. They were all first round knockouts. Yep. So you had a lot of luck there. And and you remember the guy's name who you beat? On my pro debut, no, I don't remember his name. His name is Kensky Rodney. And you showed him what, what being like Keith Thurman was like because you knocked him out with a body shot. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what do you what do you how'd you feel after getting that first one? I felt good. The only thing is, um, he the referee stopped it while he was still up, mm. and that's the only thing I didn't like about it. You know, <laughs> I mean, getting my first uh, KO victory, I was really hoping for a KO and not a TKO. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, obviously the ref was a good referee. He saw that this guy wasn't firing back. He was taking good blows, and that it was a matter of time. And he jumped in for the safety of the fighter doing his job. You know, so I can't be mad. And who trained you for your first fight? Was it Dan Birmingham? Um, it was Ben Getty, but um, I was working with Dan also. He was in my corner that night. Um, Dan started working my corner ever since um, I turned pro. So he was there for my pro debut. And um, his brother, um, Mike Birmingham, who was our cut man at the time, he passed away shortly right after my trainer passed away. So... Um, Three years ago, I lost two of my quarter men 
within a fraction of months of each other. So yeah. um, it's kind of a tragedy or whatnot, but you know, it we just we move on and you know we remember we remember them for you know the people that they were. Mm-hmm. Like I said, man, we just keep moving on in this game of boxing. No, oh, you can do. It's like life. And and what separates Dan from from other trainers? For you. Um, you know, he's got a, a lot of experience. Um, he, the one thing that kind of separates Dan a little bit is me and Ben started off at a very young age. And Dan and Winky started off at a very young age, you know. Mm-hmm. And Winky only had one trainer throughout his whole career. Yep. So that's one thing that I do really like about Dan is that he knows what it's like to stay by a fighter's side for their whole career. Mm -hmm. You know, where other trainers sometimes, you know, they just have somebody fly in or something, and they were working with him once upon a time, they were working with this guy once upon a time, you know, and then they get their hands on him, and he happens to win a championship, and they think that, you know, what he did made him a champion, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But Dan Birmingham does know how to create champions, and he has developed champions, and so that's something I really admire about Dan. Mm -hmm. He's different. And I, I, Winky Ray was always one of my favorite fighters, and, and he's a 154 pounder too. So you know Dan has has good experience working with junior middleweights. So that's good. And, and and did you ever have an opportunity to really talk to Winky Ray and get to know him well? Uh, yeah, man, Wink's a real cool dude. Um, we've been in a few camps together. You know, he's brought me in for a, a camp or two or whatnot, and um, you know. It was, always a great uh, learning experience whenever I got in there with Wink. Yeah. What do you think of Winky's fight with Peter Quillen? Did you help prepare him for that one? Yeah, yeah, I was there for that. Um, you know, the only thing I think about that fight is it would have been a little better if Wink didn't have such a long layoff, mm-hmm. you know? Maybe if he would have uh, took a tune-up before Going after that, that uh, you know, that tough line there, um, yeah. I think Winky would have been able to give us a, a better performance. I think Winky performed quite well for um, his age and um, how long he's been off, you know. Um, but I think if he really, really wanted that, uh, wanted that victory, he should have took a tune-up fight. Yeah. You think he's gonna stay retired? Oh uh, yes, sir, man. He's got a. Uh, he had one heck of a career. You know, yes, he did. Um, and I think he put that fight, you know, just to see if he's still one of those top dogs, you know, mm-hmm. instead of just going and taking that tune up and preparing. I think he just wanted to see, am I still the man, you know, mm-hmm. seeing that there's, you know, the level of competition there is out there and whatnot. And I think he's just letting it go. You know, I think he was trying to, you know, if he could get his hands on a belt. If he would have won and whatnot and got a few more uh, big fights, I think he he would have stuck in it. But you know, I think I think he's probably quite satisfied with what he's done in his career, and he should be. Yeah, yeah, he should be. And, and thank God for Winky. He's a, it was fun to watch throughout those years. And, and that that trilogy with Bronco McCart was one of my favorite trilogies ever. It really was. You soon after you turned pro, you fought Tremaine Boone. You hit him in the temple, and he fell down. And he started swelling immediately, and the ref stopped the fight right away. What was that fight like, and what were you thinking when, when you saw that happen to him? Well, you know, the dude the dude's record speaks for himself. I think he only had about two pro fights. I don't know if the dude had any amateur background. Um, so, you know, I knew I was going to go in there and pretty much give him a taste of something he's never felt before. You know, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't care who the hardest hitter in his gym is. It's not Keith Thurman. You know, so I knew that once when I got a nice little punch in on him, he was gonna. He was gonna. You know, get wobbled or shook up from it. And I was surprised that that happened for my first punch. It was the first punch that I threw in the fight. So mm-hmm. catching him like that, it was a quick little whiplash hook. It mm-hmm. hit him like you said right on the temple. He went down. He didn't get up. The ref stopped it. And all I could think is, if he went down from that, then it's over, because he's a chump. Mm. Walked away from, we got it on film, um, I walked away, and I kind of did a little 
uh, little slipping of the throat, little executioner, you know, little symbol of this guy's done. He's through. Mm-hmm. Oh, no matter what, even if he gets up, he's a chump. It's over. You know, he can't take that. I got a lot more for him. You know, so. <laughs> some clever laying stuff. <laughs> yes, sir. And in, in your fifth fight, you fought Jesse Davis. You beat him up pretty good, and you landed another vicious body shot. Do you like body shots? And do you, I, I know your father taught you about it. I'm sure. But do you focus on that in the gym in particular? Put emphasis um, on it? You know, the way that I look at it is I'm going to take whatever you give me, you know? I mean, it, if it's difficult to hit you in the head, why am I going to focus on the head? Hmm. You know? So, you know, I'm just looking for openings wherever I can score, a legal scoring blow. And, you know, a lot of times that body's present. You know, people like to protect themselves um, in the face. And especially when they got their hands up and they can feel how hard I'm hitting, you know, they can feel that and they know they don't want to get caught mm-hmm. flesh. So they keep their hands up high. So I just drop it down low mm-hmm. and, and it works out most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Usually is open and you, and you fight Omar Bell when he's six and oh, and you're six and oh, and you knock Omar Bell out and he's down for like five minutes. Are you worried for the guy when, when, when he's not getting up or do you just oh. think it's the hurt business? the hurt business you know i was i wasn't really too concerned at first but then once when i found out that they did have to take him to the hospital you know i kind of said my little rendezvous to the father you know i was like you know lord just let this man be okay you know what i'm saying we're not trying to um destroy people you know 100 percent. you know i want him to live and breathe and walk another day things like that you know i want him to have be able to talk to his family and i don't know if the, if the brother had any kids or anything but if he's going to have kids you know i want his senses to be there you know so i was just happy that i was able to get the job done i was able to get another first round ko and you know he was able to recover yeah, and he was okay and, and that must have felt good <laughs> to know the guy was okay tell me about the francisco francisco garcia fight ended in a head clash and it went down as a one round no contest. Um, that fight was a little disappointing because I was getting some nice, uh, some nice rockers in the first round there, and I could see that even if this guy is not going to go out in the first, we should be able to do it in the second. Mm-hmm. And uh, something just happened, man. I don't know what happened. You know, I knew he was going to go for a blow, and so I went to go duck, but I, I ducked in a slightly forward a forward tilt motion mm-hmm. and he came in swinging with a slightly forward tilt motion so that's how the clash of heads happened you know i felt the clash instantly boom you know um it was right on the top of my head and it was right over one of his eyebrows and he was slick the rest stopped it went to the doctor um and when i looked at him blood was just gushing out Mm. So I had to, I kind of knew the doctor was going to stop it right there, and he sure did. And it, you know, it was just a no contest, nothing I could do about it. It was just whatever, you know. Just gotta, gotta keep working. Mm-hmm. And you fought Travis Hartman on ESPN, and he added nerves. First televised fight, Teddy Atlas and Bob Papa ringside. You get nervous at all? Nah, there was no nerves. You know, I mean, we knew who we were fighting once again. You know. um all that was, those were, I still consider that, you know, it wasn't even like a come out fight, you know. Um, we, you know, I had a good manager at that time. I was being managed by uh, Shelly Finkel. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel confident, you know. I mean, I train hard. I work hard. I know how, how long I've been in the game for. And the guy was moving up to fight me, you know, so I knew I was bigger, stronger. And, you know, we just took care of business once again. You did, and your next fight after that, you fought uh, Edvin Dos Santos Barros. He's the only guy to take you the distance. You went eight full rounds. How'd that happen? How do you get away? <laughs> um, multiple things. Um, one, I didn't, I didn't consult with my manager about the weight for that fight. Mm-hmm. So I was preparing to make 147, and somehow through my diet and exercise. I ended up coming in at 145 pounds. Hmm. I, last time I weighed that, I was like a, I was like a freshman in high school. Hmm. So I, that really shocked me that I came in so light. 
the contracted weight happened to be 149 pounds. So, you know, I was four pounds under the contracted weight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't really say too much. You know, the dude, the dude just happened to slip a lot, you know. The dude protected himself. You know, if you don't want to get knocked out, protect yourself at all times. Um, so he would throw punches and then he would slip out. And that kind of neutralized my counter left hook. Mm-hmm. And I probably should have came in with a few more uppercuts. But, you know, I was fighting a good fight. I was winning the rounds. I dropped him in the seventh round. I believe that was with a body shot. He got up and he, uh, he held pretty decently. You know, he clenched up and recovered. And then by the time it was the eighth round, I said, you know what? Let's give these guys... Let's give these guys what they want, which is the full eight rounds, you know? Mm-hmm. I've been trying to let everybody know that that happened one time. It's not going to happen again, you know, because my nickname is one time. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things in my career have already happened one time. You haven't got to it yet, but I have been knocked down mm-hmm. one time, you know? So I don't I don't plan on ever seeing that mat again, and I just keep on planning on bringing y'all some KOs, man, KOs for life. Yeah, so you're gonna try to knock everyone out. Were you upset at all not knocking them out when you left that ring? Nah, man, because you know it was a good, it was a good performance. Mm-hmm. It was a good fight. I happened to be the main event here in Tampa, mm-hmm. um, so I got to be a main event here in my hometown, and that felt pretty good to just give them all that show. And um, you know, I dropped them or whatnot, you know, so I proved that I had power. And then I even, you know, in the seventh round. So that proved that I have power in the late rounds, you know. So I mm-hmm. felt overall good about the fight. Yeah, you get to know your your own self better, and, and you know you could go eight full rounds. So it, it, it's necessary, you know. You can't knock everyone out. And after after that fight, you went to Quebec, and and you fought on the undercard of Lucien Boutet and Labrado Andrade rematch. How how did you like Quebec when you was that the first time you fought out of America as a pro? Or pro, yes, it was. It was my second time in Canada. Mm-hmm. First time at pro. Um, Quebec was beautiful, man. I mean, some of the building structures they have there, the, some of the buildings, um, especially like government buildings, are like 400 years old or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But definitely a sight to see with all their statues. And then uh, it was around November, so it was uh, it was snowing, man. And, you know, and coming from Florida, we don't ever see snow. So... It was kind of cool. I didn't really have the right winter wear and whatnot, but we were able to make it all work out. <laughs> and what's the what's the atmosphere like in Canada for a Butte fight? And, and oh man, oh man, they love Butte. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, he's a good fighter too, so they should. You know, um, he put on a real good performance that night. You know, he kind of cleared up that whole little um, that little match thing that happened before. You know, they felt like. The ref gave him a lot of time in that last round that the one guy was about to stop him in the last round or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he just outclassed him and stopped him earlier, you know, stopped him somewhere in the sixth, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the, the thing about Quebec, though, is half of the population speaks French, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. So you walk into a store and they start speaking French before they speak English. Yeah, yeah. Could be. Overall, it's definitely a positive experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and you ended up getting back on the knockout path yourself, and you stopped Leonardo Rojas in two rounds. And then you made quick work of seven and zero Stalin Lopez on your Telefutura debut. Then you fight Quandre Robertson, and you knock him out in three rounds. But you're down in the first. You alluded to it before. That was your first time down. And what do you remember about that one? And when you went down, what do you remember about the knockdown? Man, that right there, that's a fight I'm never going to forget, you know, because that was my first uh, knockdown there, being knocked down. Mm-hmm. So, um, he hit, he, he knocked me down with the opening punch, you know. He came in and we, we did an extra little tap glove thing, you know, mm-hmm. and, I was, and then we backed up and we were starting to circle each other and I was thinking all these thoughts in my head like, okay, Keith, how do you want to knock this guy out this fight, you know? Mm. Are you going to put on a show for Golden Boy and stuff? And uh, as I'm as I'm daydreaming pretty much, because I thought he was at a safe distance, he does this little lean-in, jumping left hook that hits the top of my head and just puts me on my side. You know, I go over, I kind of fall on my butt, but I do it in a sideways motion. And 
I don't know on what part of the count I got up on, but I know I did recover pretty quickly. And I remember, though, before I stood up fully, that I stared at the blue mat. And I was yelling at myself at this point. I was cussing at myself. I said, look where the you are. You know, this is not where you're supposed to be. Oscar De La Hoya is sitting over there somewhere in the front row. You did not come here for him to see you here, you know. So I just pretty much gave myself this real quick little pep talk. Um, I made myself understand that it's fight time now. You know, you're already down in the scorecards. There's nothing for you to lose now. If you're going to lose this fight, you're going to lose this fight on your back. You know, this guy already put you down once, so bump it, whatever, you know. If you're going to lose this fight, you're going to lose it on your back. So I just went full throttle, you know. It was pretty much the worst thing the kid could have done was hit me with that shot because all it did was wake me up yeah. and, you know, turn me into a little beast and monster. <laughs> just started going after him, you know, round after round. I got the knockdown back in the first round. That made me feel good, you know, because I know that now the scorecards are back neutral and that it's just going to be based off on who landed the better punches throughout the round. And I knew that was me. So I knew I won the first round, went out on the second round, went out on the third round, and I dropped them every single round, and the rest stopped it after the third knockdown. And that's a nice way to get payback, man. Oscar De La Hoya thought he was putting a fight on, and then he saw a basketball game break out, and he started dribbling them <laughs> every round. On the undercard, though, you, you, you're, that's the undercard of Shane Mosley, right, in the Sergio Mora fight? Yes, sir. And, and how, do you, how do you feel? Did you... Did you have, when you're going through the press conferences and stuff, this is the biggest fight you've ever been on at that point and with Golden Boy and stuff. What was that like for you going through that? Actually, on that fight, I actually missed the press conference. Mm. Uh, I was a little kind of like tired getting adjusted to the time over there in California compared to uh, East Coast. So while the press conference was happening, I was actually taking a nap. And I heard Oscar De La Hoya kind of just made a statement about me to the crowd and, you know, what they can expect from me, what kind of fighter I am. And, you know, after hearing that, I was actually uh, quite pleased to hear Oscar say um, positive things. And what does that feel like? You had to grow up watching Oscar, and now he's talking on your behalf. It's got to be flattering. Oh, it, it is flattering, man. You know, I mean, he's a great fighter, and he's a great businessman. No. Uh, much respect to Oscar De La Hoya. Absolutely. And on the undercard, too, was Canelo Alvarez. What would you think of him? You might be fighting him one day. What's your opinions of Canelo? Um, I think he's beatable, you know? Everybody is, in reality, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, De La Hoya has done a great job with him. And, you know, I would be. I, I would like to get in the ring with him one day. But because we're in separate weight classes, you know, I'm not in a real big rush to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after the Robertson fight, you fought Fabio Medina. This was November 2010. What was that one like? Um, that one was nice because that was my first fight at the MGM Grand. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just felt real good to be performing in Vegas, you know, where so many of the big fights have gone down. And uh, he had one of the best records that I was going up against at that point in my career. Mm -hmm. And... I just box smart, did my thing, landed my punches and my counter punches, and I think somewhere at the end of the first round, I broke his nose. He was leaking for the whole fight, and uh, I actually felt bad after the second or third round because I was tired of hitting him in his nose because how much he was bleeding. I had blood all over me. My corner was wiping blood off me every all on a, every single uh, in between round, and. You know, I, I was just being a little patient. I was trying to knock him out in the, I think it was third round, with some big looping shots. Mm -hmm. And he just kept his hands up. He was kind of smart. And in the fourth round, I was able to land a series of counters and then come in with a right uppercut left hook and end the fight. And Andre Berto was on that undercard, too. Did you have a chance to go and watch the fights after your fight? Yes, sir. Berto made, you know, quick you know, he had a quick victory that night, first round KO or TKO, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that was the night Juan Manuel Marquez fought Michael Katsidis, too. What do you think about Juan Manuel? You've got to respect him. That was, that was an action-packed fight, you yeah, know. it was. Uh, um, we all know 
Mar- I was, you know, mad respect for Marquez for that performance and coming out with the victory because Castitas did drop him that fight, mm-hmm. you know. So it was really, I was really impressed to see him get up, keep his composure, and um, keep throwing those combinations that he was doing. And, you know, Castitas had a crazy work rate mm-hmm. during that fight. But that's what kind of ended up getting him in the end. He ended up wasting a little too much energy. And in those later rounds, he just had nothing to keep his hands up. He was getting caught with almost every uh, combination Marquez was stolen at that point. Mm-hmm. And yeah, also on that card, Eris Landy Lara. You might be fighting him too. What do you think of him? One day. One day you might be fighting him. Who's that? Eris Landy Lara, the Cuban defector. Oh, the Cuban? Yeah. I actually... um. I was probably in the room taking a shower while his fight went on, so I mm-hmm. didn't get to see his performance. Mm-hmm. I do know who he is, and, you know, a well-talented Cuban fighter. Mm, yep. And, and would you, uh, I'm sorry, did, did you, uh, you didn't fight in 15 months after that. And and what happened to you? Did you, you got hurt, right? You hurt I your fractured knuckle. my hand in that fight. Yeah. And then uh, after the fracture, recovered. I still felt some pain. We did an MRI, and we found bone bruising in my fifth metacarpal. And so, you know, we just did the doctor's orders and kind of laid off it, you know? Yeah, and a couple fights fell through too, right? How, how frustrated were you with the with not being able to get back in the ring in all 2011? Uh, a little frustrating, you know. But, um, you know, God is good. You know, he, he got a plan for everybody. You know, he uh, taught me a little something about patience that year. And, um, you know, I'm just I'm just grateful that I was able to uh, do what I had to do, get my bills paid that year, and uh, recover and back into action now, you know. It's always good to be up to date on your bills. <laughs> it's always good, man. Sure. And you returned in February this year, and you scored two stoppages against Chris Fernandez and Brandon Hoskins. Brandon Hoskins was 16-0 and 0 on, on the night that you fought him, and it was on the undercard of Floyd Mayweather and Miguel Cotto and the Saul, and, and Saul Canelo Alvarez and Shane Mosley undercard. Take me back to that night. What was that like, fighting Hoskins? Uh, it, was, it was great, you know. Um, Hoskins, I felt real good um, going in against Hoskins. I felt real bad for him because I knew he was, I was going to punish his undefeated record. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like if whoever was managing him, you know, they probably should have built him up to 18-0 and 0 before letting him take that kind of punishment for a payday. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I had that was the camp that I got to work with Wink um, prior to. And so, you know, I just felt... 100% confident going into that fight. Trained real hard. We were uh, out of state for some training camp and stuff. And, you know, I was just really focused. Um, I found out that it was going to be aired on the pay-per-view preview mm-hmm. panel. Yep. And, uh, you know, that just kind of made me feel that even better. Um, it made me want to showcase some of my skills and talent, which I did in that fight. And, um you know, overall, that was just uh, another great performance, man. Another another quick night. What would you think of the main event, Floyd and Miguel Cotto going at it? Um, I thought it was a good fight. Um, uh, someone did a little short interview with me before. Uh, I was able to walk into the ring asking me about, or walk into the venue asking me about the fight that was after my fight, after I got uh, showered up and dressed up. And, uh, I told him, you know, I expect Floyd Mayweather to win, but I expect Cotto to give us a better performance that night than he would have two years ago against Floyd Mayweather, and I think I was right. You know, I think Cotto gave us a great performance. Yeah, you look like a psychic now. And what would you think of Canelo retiring Shane that night? What did you think of that one? You a, you a fan of Shane's growing up? What's that? Were you a fan of Shane Mosley's growing up? Nah, nah, nah. I know. So, no, no, more of a fan of uh, Roy Jones, Mike Tyson, started like that. No. Um, to be honest, to be honest, I'm I'm glad Shane is um is done. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like, you know, I mean, I, I feel like he had his best, 
and he's gotten a lot out of the world of boxing. And, you know, there are big, young, exciting fighters like Canelo, um, myself, and others. You know, there are all these young fighters coming up. And uh, I just, the only reason why I kind of, I'm glad that he's done is because I don't like hearing the same names over and over recycled in the world of boxing. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, knowing that he's out, knowing that, you know, um, Wink, Winky's out, and knowing that um, Bernard, Hop, uh, Hop, Hop, yeah, Bernard, Bernard might be getting out here soon, you know, that just gives uh, more spotlight to the younger fighters, and I'm looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. You, you have to look up to Floyd Mayweather either for his skills or whatever. There's always something you got to respect about Floyd, though. But did you have a chance to talk to Floyd Mayweather at all during that? Um, no, nah, I never talked to Floyd. And how would you fight Floyd if you had to? And how do you, how do you like um, your chances? <laughs> you never know. Floyd, you know, I don't even know if I want to answer that. I mean, I don't even know if I want to put out that. The, the how to beat Floyd Mayweather tactic out there. Mm-hmm. But all I got to say is just look at the number one punch that Cotto landed the most on Floyd that night. Mm-hmm. And, I would, and I would utilize that a lot into my strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I've talked to people about, about that fight and uh, a lot of people don't know what the most effective punch that Cotto was able to land on Floyd but that's what I would bring into the ring. I would, I would bring that and mm-hmm. just basic boxing, you know, but, um, and I would use my, my reflexes, you know, I'm young, I know Floyd's sharp, I know he's fast, and I know he's accurate, you know, but uh, timing and distance, if I can just get him to reach a little bit, if I can get him to reach just a little bit and uh, to bring in one of my one-time counters in, you know, Mosley was able to land that big right hand on him, you know, so if I got a nice pretty left hook, you might see his legs get shook too. Mm. And now, now Floyd's getting in the promoting game with Fifty Cent. What do you think of TMT and what they bring to the sport? Um, I don't know, man. We'll see. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, we'll see. I mean, he's the money man. You know, <laughs> he's made enough money um, in his career that he could do something like that. And you know, I don't, I don't really have a problem with there being more promoters. You know, as long as you promote fighters right, you know, I mean, I kind of look forward to what Floyd's going to end up doing in the world of boxing with his new uh, company. Yeah, it should be exciting. Your last fight, you fought Orlando Laura. You fought him on HBO. Is there any added nerves being on HBO for the first time? Live? Uh, eh, they're kind of, eh, I kind of threw them out the window, man. I said, don't even focus on the cameras. The cameras aren't even here. Mm. You know what I mean? Those are just those are just extra spectators, you know? Yep. And, um, you know, my motto is, you know, I'll fight anywhere. You know what I mean? You put me in the middle of Africa with a ring, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to fight, you know? Yeah. It don't matter where, you don't matter where you put me. You can, I don't want to be in Antarctica, but if you put a ring there, I'm going to fight, <laughs> you know? So it just is what it is, man. I just, you know, I let myself realize, you know, it was my first HBO event. <laughs> It's mm-hmm. been my dream, you know, ever since I was a child. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one day you're going to be an HBO fighter. I didn't even tell myself you're going to fight on Showtime. <laughs> I said, one day you're going to be an HBO fighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to see that manifest and to manifest, you know, the way that it did, um, I'm just truly grateful. You know, I'm glad that uh, I got a lot of positive feedback from my performance. And uh, I'm glad that, you know, the commentators, everyone on HBO, um, enjoyed the show. I, I was able to build up my fan base from that one fight, mm-hmm. you know, and so I'm just really grateful and, you know, looking forward to continuing creating some knockouts on HBO. And that was on the undercard of Broner and Vicente Escobedo. What's your thoughts on Adrian Broner? A bad little dude, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Skillful, mimics Floyd, but, you know, I mean, he's just a, a really good boxer. Well talented fighter. Mm-hmm. And where are you now in, in terms of your career? Where do you feel you are? Um, shoot, I feel like I'm at the starting point. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Everything that I everything that I did was a warm up up yeah. until this point. And 
now it's go time. Now it's, now it's show time. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go and we're going to show the rest of the world who Keith Thurman is from here on out. I can't wait, man. And, and tell me a little more about Al Heyman. He, he kind of lays low. But, and we see him on TV all the time, and he's making massive moves all the time lately, past couple years, signing lots of talent. Who is Al Heyman, and how does he approach it? Um, Al Heyman is pretty much one of the smartest businessmen in the world of boxing. Hmm. And he's highly educated on a lot of fighters in the world of boxing. And he goes after the fighters that, you know, he believes in. He believes that, you know, should, that their talent should be showcased, you know, for the world to see. Yeah, and we see all the results. We've got a lot of young champions coming up and lots of guys like you who looks like you're almost ready and almost there. Is there a time frame for your title shot? And who strategizes your next moves? Is it, is it Al Heyman? Or do you, does he, does he uh, ask you what you want, how you feel? Yeah, it's me and Heyman, you know. I mean, a manager works for the fighters, you know. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't overstep his boundaries or anything. He works with his fighters and he respects his fighters. And he negotiates with his fighters and he negotiates on behalf of his fighters. And um, just like I said, man, he's just one of the best in the world of boxing doing it right now. And what do you what do you think uh, you can do to be become a more complete fighter? Of course, everyone... You should never stop learning, no matter what point you are in your career. What do you what do you see that you should work on when you critique yourself? Um, I want to drop more people with the right hand because my left hook is deadly. But I just <laughs> I wish I could. I wish it. I want to see it happen both ways, and then um, I don't know, man. I mean, I've been in so many fights, you know, with my amateur career and stuff. Um. You know, we just kind of we just kind of perfect the little things. You know, keep your hands up at all times. Don't get lazy. Don't get sloppy. Stay on beat. Stay on tempo. If someone lets you get off tempo, hop right back into your tempo as soon as possible. You know what I mean? Don't let someone control you. You know, stay in control. Um, so it, it's just like a whole bunch of little things, man. It's kind of like just stay polished. You know what I mean? When you all, if you all got a nice whip, all you gotta do is take care of it. You know. That's it. So. That's pretty much what we're doing, man. You know, I've worked hard. I've developed um, a lot of skills and talents. And um, we're just trying to keep it all finely tuned and polished. Mm-hmm. And what's the reason for the long hair? Is there any reason or you just like it? Man. <laughs> Don't you get hot in Florida? I'm a child, man. <laughs> like, when I was little, I cut my hair because they were calling me a girl, you know? Yeah. And that doesn't feel good being a young man growing up being called a girl. <laughs> so we had to we had to chop that off, let them understand who I am and whatever. But as soon as um you know, I got into middle school, I started to get some peach fuzz on my face <laughs> and I got hair under my arms, you know. I said I I highly doubt anybody cares if I grow my hair out. So, you know, somewhere around the sixth grade or something I decided to let my hair start growing back. So you won't cut it again, you're like Samson maybe. <laughs> yeah, man, that was the that was the nickname we had walking around in the amateur circuit. Some people would call me Sam's. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it, Keith, man. Thanks a lot, man, and we'll be rooting for you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, man. God bless. Take care.